All right, well, listen, everybody, welcome. Welcome to the um, April CCL call. This is the 147th month that we've had our monthly call. So there's some of us who've been for almost all of those. We we'll include Marshall Saunders in that category. Um, so what's going to be happening is in just a moment, I'm going to introduce our guest, and then we'll go over some of the exciting things that happened since last month's call. Uh, we'll go over the actions for the month and um, uh, have a lot of uh, very exciting things to report. Um, our guest today is Reverend Susan Hendershot from Interfaith Power and Light. Uh, the mission of Interfaith Power and Light is to be faithful stewards of creation by, by responding to global warming through the promotion of energy conservation, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. Uh, Reverend Hendershot is ordained in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ with a Master's of Divinity degree from Emory University in Atlanta. And Reverend Hendershot, uh, I always like to tell our speaker a little bit about the people that they're talking to. And I think the thing that most reflects these people is what they do. So I just want to give you a, a, just a thumbnail of some of the things they've done recently. So for instance, last month they added 5,008 supporters. Since the start of the year, they've started 38 new chapters. Last month alone, they published 307 op-eds and letters to the editor. Included in that, they've been getting some really uh, important statements of support, endorsements. So that includes the city of Chicago, and that includes uh, districts one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine. I know that for all of you in Chicago, there were so many people involved in that. I know you know who you are. I can't mention everybody, but that was really important getting a municipal resolution. Also, we got a statement of support from the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and for uh, Carl Danz, for the business climate leaders. Um, this is huge. That's not just Google. That's not just Microsoft. That's over 300 companies. So to have a statement of support from, from that group was amazing. This week, the state of Maryland passed a very good bill that's gonna do a lot to reduce emissions. Jamie DeMarco, our state policy coordinator, has been working on that with a lot of CCL volunteers. So congratulations to everybody there. And also in terms of endorsements, former Energy Secretary Stephen Chu endorsed the bill. Peter Joseph, really good work, great job of fostering that relationship. And then the last thing is, this time of year, we, do, we have a lot of uh, lobby meetings in district. Uh, in June, we'll be trying to see the entire Congress. But last year in February and June, I mean, excuse me, February and March, we had 104 meetings and 23% of those were face-to-face -face with the actually member of Congress in attendance. This year, in February and March, we've had 245 meetings and 38% of those in district meetings are face-to-face. -face. So Reverend Hendershaw, I just want you to know that these are not people who listen to this and say, well, isn't that an interesting talk? These are the kind of people who are desperate for any type of uh, kernel that's gonna help them be effective with all those kinds of people they publish, with organizations they reach out to to get statements of support, and also for their meetings with their congressional representatives and those and aides. So Reverend Hendershaw, welcome, uh, and so great to have you this morning. Thank you so much, and, and I wanna, First of all, I want to thank you, Mark, for the invitation to be here today. I um, actually ha have worked alongside CCL groups. I'm, I'm curious to know who's on from Iowa because I missed the Iowa introductions, but I spent a lot of years in Iowa. So I, um, I actually, um, oh, my, my screen is doing weird things. Um, I actually uh, spent a long, a long time working alongside our, our groups in Iowa when I was the director of Iowa Interfaith Power and Light before coming to the national office. So, um, so it's just it's great to get that snapshot of what of what's been accomplished. And and I also want to say just as by way of introduction that um, before I was with Interfaith Power and Light and I was serving congregations, I actually was a uh, co-chair of the uh, results group in Des Moines. And so, of course, I know the organizing model really well from, from my time with results. And you're right. I mean, it's, it's amazing what you can accomplish with this many people um, doing that work together and just that sense of community that can happen. So, um, so thank all of you for the amazing work that you're doing and for, for being here today. Um, so I, I'm going to try to be mindful of time because I want to leave plenty of time for the Q&A. Um, but I did want to start just with a, a really quick snapshot of how I got into um, doing uh, faith climate work. And um, 
And I was a pastor serving local congregations, as I mentioned. And the issue um, that I was really focused on at the time was the issue of hunger. And that's, of course, why I was involved with the results group, because uh, that was certainly uh, hunger and poverty core issues that we were working on uh, with, with results. And um, climate change was an issue that I was aware of. You know, I had gone to a workshop that Iowa Interfaith Power and Light had put on. Um, you know, I was recycling and changing my light bulbs and all those things that, you know, we do to take personal action. Um, but I didn't find climate change as compelling of an issue as hunger, um, primarily because it, it felt, hunger felt more immediate. It felt like a more um, uh, immediate issue for, for us to work on. And then um, I read an article on the geopolitics of food that really helped me connect the dots between um, crop losses that were due to drought and wildfire that were fueled by climate change, um, resulting food shortages, and then the rise of conflict that was connected to that. And what I realized is that if I wanted to, to uh, you know, really make progress on the issue of hunger, that I needed to work on climate change. And so I really did a shift at that point. And the more I learned about it, of course, the more I realized that my sons and their generation would be even more impacted by the issue than I was. Um, and of course, you know, we're all feeling the impacts now. But I, I wanted to be able to look my sons in the eye and tell them that I had done everything I could um, to work for solutions to this, you know, major crisis. And um, that's really still my motivation. I mean, I, I still, you know, sort of use them as my personal motivation for this work. And, you know, I'm grateful for the work that I get to do. I, I frankly, I wish I could work myself out of a job, as I'm sure we all do, right? Um, but, but uh, you know, that doesn't look to happen at least during this administration. So we're gonna we're gonna keep moving forward. Um, and so, you know, I was really fortunate to be able to start uh, as the director of Iowa Interfaith Power and Light. I served in that capacity for seven years, <laughs> excuse me, seven years. Um, really important state to work in. Excuse me. <coughs> and, um, and then, you know, about 15 months ago, I shifted into my role here at, uh, as president of the national organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, our mission is really about inspiring and mobilizing people of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on climate change. We were started in the year 2000 by an Episcopal priest named uh, Sally Bingham. Some of you may know Sally. And um, her vision was really about connecting faith and ecology, which she didn't see happening um, in congregations. And so um, her focus, <coughs> excuse me, when we began was, um, was really on uh, helping congregations to lower their energy use as an act of faith. <coughs> so now, here we are 19 years later, we have 40 state affiliates that are located around the country. Some of you may work alongside um, our affiliates and, and uh, work together on events and things that are happening locally in, in your um, communities and in your states. And I think this gives us a, a, a unique ability to work um, at the local, the state, and the national levels, uh, which um, for, for us, I think, is, is really important. Because right now, we know that a lot of progress can be made at the local level, whether it's through um, local initiatives to uh, go to 100% clean energy or, um, you know, city climate action plans, <coughs> any kind of adaptation measures that need to happen. So, um, and then opportunities at the state level to advance clean energy initiatives as well. Um, and then, of course, all the work that we're doing at the federal level, which is um, a lot around um, protecting EPA rules right now, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but also looking for opportunities to advance legislation that will get us where we need to be. And so um, I really think of our work in, in sort of a systems approach way. So 
So we think about, um, you know, the way in the door sometimes is through programs. And we run for programs that, um, and I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to name the programs for you, but there is a lot of information on our programs available on our website. It's just interfaithpowerandlight.org. It's all spelled out. Um, you can find our programs and a lot more information there. Um, but the first program that we started was called Cool Congregations, and it really is a way for congregations to lower their energy use um, in their facilities as an act of faith. And so we help them measure their energy use. We teach them ways that they can reduce um, their energy use. And of course, the net benefit for them is more money for their mission, less money that they're spending on their energy bills. So we think that this is like a, just a very practical tool and a way into the conversation so people can learn more about the issue. Um, we also run a program that, that is happening right now, this very week, called Faith Climate Action Week. And, um, and Faith Climate Action Week is really, it's a focused opportunity for faith leaders to preach and teach on climate change from the pulpit, um, as well as, you know, we, we do film screenings, we do, there are a lot of initiatives and um, on our website, you know, uh, people can, can like post their event that they're doing in their state so others can find out, um, you know, what people are doing. Um, so that's been a little, little more focused. This has been a long-term program of ours, but it used to be called the Preach-In on Climate Change. We shifted it to being called Faith Climate Action Week a few years ago. Um, we have a program called Cool Harvest, which teaches people about how their food choices are connected to climate change. Um, of course, uh, for most congregations, you, you almost can't get together without food happening. And so we think that this is a really good connection. And plus, people eat, right? They, that's, you know, so, so uh, you know, how can, we, how can we eat lower on the food chain? How can we, you know, source locally? Um, you know, there's a lot of, of conversation around food in our culture right now. So this is a great, uh, another great program. And then we actually have a carbon offset program where, um, you know, pe people can actually um, buy carbon offsets and what this is is a tree planting program. So we plant trees in Tanzania um, as a way to offset carbon emissions and we're in partnership with a local organization on the ground there on that. So, um, so those are the programs. But what we, what we hope, just like I think is so great about the CCL model is um, you know, we, we work people up the ladder of engagement, right? So, so it's not, you don't just do one thing, right? We hope that you're not just going to, you know, change your light bulbs. Ultimately, what we hope is you're also going to get involved in advocacy. And so the conversation around that for us is, again, it's this, this connection between the local, the state, and the federal work. Um, so, you know, I mean, just a few uh, really brief examples um, you know, we have, for example, in Illinois, the Clean Jobs Bill um, that was passed and Faith in Place, which is our Illinois IPL affiliate, was um, very involved in, in that in partnership with many, many organizations. And um, one of the main things that they worked on in particular was the environmental justice component of that and the carve out of jobs for uh, returning citizens and foster care alumni. So that was really where they were able to dig into that issue. Um, we have, you know, states that have been involved in their 100% clean energy um, campaigns in their state, New Mexico, uh, here in California. Um, and then federally, you know, we're doing a, a lot of work on uh, EPA rules. So we've been very involved in clean in the work on the fuel efficiency standards. Um, most recently, um, turning out faith leaders to testify at the Mercury hearing that was held in Washington D.C. Um, and um, you know, submitting comments to the EPA as well as tracking um, federal legislation that can move us toward the kind of um, carbon, <laughs> low carbon future that we, that we all want, right? Um, and so one of the things that we've done most recently around that is um, in thinking about any climate legislation federally, um, we've created a set of faith principles that we want to see in Included in any federal legislation that uh, is around climate or energy. And, um, you know, those include 
uh, the just a just transition for workers. They include, you know, how we are not leaving communities behind in a clean energy transition. So low low income communities, communities of color in particular. Um, we, uh, it, it actually does talk about how it needs to be grounded in science because faith and science actually aren't in opposition to one another, um, as, as, you know, some people may believe. Um, so these faith principles really can guide us in, you know, how we talk about legislation. And in fact, we're doing a fly in, um, May 1st will be our day on the Hill. And these faith principles are going to be in all of the packets that we take to our members of Congress um, as a way to talk about um, what we feel needs to be included. And it, does, it also does help us talk about legislation in a very bipartisan way, which of course is also really important to CCL. Um, so we're not going in, you know, waving the banner of the Green New Deal or anything like that. We're just saying, um, you know, we're tracking these pieces of legislation and here are the principles that we want to make sure are included in any climate legislation. Um, so again, it's, it's working people up the ladder of engagement, um, whether it's, you know, it much the same way, letters to the editor, op-eds, you know, any of the media work, um, the, the, you know, town, attending town hall meetings, um, you know, doing uh, Hill visits in this case. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we have a combination of both personal action and um, that we allow, you know, we give people a way into the advocacy world. Um, so I want to, I actually want to stop there because I want to make sure we have time for Q&A. And so I'm kind of tracking my time over here. So um, Mark, I don't know how you, how you want to do that, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, have, I'll have Ricky track the uh, questions in the chat, but the first thing I want to ask you is, you know, the people in our chapters are really interested in giving people an opportunity to move up their engagement themselves. Mm -hmm. you know, to whatever degree people are comfortable with. So uh, how do you how do you approach, you know, giving people a chance to maybe start with something small and then take on more as they go along? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and so, you know, I want to give you a, an example of something that we did when I was in Iowa, because um, this is a, a similar model that, that many of our state affiliates would use. Um, and, you know, our affiliates are working <laughs> much more closely with people on the ground. Um, so, so an example of that would be that we would do a cool congregations workshop, for example, and we would help people me measure their energy use in their home. We would give them practical ways to um, reduce that and we would ask them to pledge a reduction um, and and they would select the things that they were going to do and and our tool actually allowed them to see how much energy reduction they would have but of course while they were at the workshop we would also do you know a, a short presentation on the issue of climate change so even if you didn't come in um, because you wanted to work on climate change, you just wanted to lower your energy use, you'd, you'd get a connection to the issue of climate change and how sort of by multiplying all of the reductions that people are pledging, we actually, you know, reduce, we, we are capable of reducing a lot of, of, ener of energy. And then because of their attendance, they would sort of flow into our list, right? So then they start um, getting other opportunities to engage. So it might be opportunities to go to other events. We would send out um, action alerts on particular topics. And, and of course, we would connect that to why this is important to us as people of faith, right? I mean, that's our, that's ultimately our talking point is sort of the why, right? And connect it to our values, you know, um, uh, connect it to the, to the, you know, moral opportunity that we have to take action. Um, and, and so that would flow into other opportunities for them to take action. Um, we also did um, a lobby day, a, a state lobby day. So it was an opportunity for people to come together um, to go to the state legislature and to talk to their legislator about um, particular um, policies, legislation that we wanted to 
to advance or or stop in, in many cases. Um, and and so the, again, it was the you know it's been this it's sort of a flow for us to keep people um, engaged and you know giving them multiple opportunities to connect to learn more about other um, other. Uh, personal actions that they can take and also ways that they can be an advocate. Nice. Okay, good. Uh, one of the questions in the chat says the Presbyterian Overture supporting carbon price and specifically mentions working with interfaith power and light. How can we leverage this statement of support? Yeah, well, you know, that uh, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I, I uh, so what happens I think sometimes is you know, denominational bodies put out these these statements, right? And then the average person, you know, sitting there, um, you know, in the pew has no idea that this actually exists. Um, so one of the things that that we've worked on in in our programs is trying to help people connect this to what their um, faith tradition has to say. So what does my faith tradition have to say about caring for creation? What does my faith tradition have to say about how about responsible energy use? I mean, some of the statements are getting very specific, right? They're they're taking positions specifically on legislation, or they're at least you know some. There are denominations who are saying you know we want all of our facilities to be um, you know 100% uh, you know carbon neutral by a certain date. And that's sometimes a heavy lift for a congregation, and sometimes they just frankly don't know that their denomination has said that. So what we're trying to do is connect um, connect that into the um, you know into our program. So you know one way that we we uh, can do a program on cool congregations is to take some time out to to have people look and find out what their uh, faith tradition actually has to say about this issue, and we've done that in um, in our programs. Um, we also, I think, give them the tools that they need in order to to do some of the actions that their denomination is asking them to take. So, for example, if their denomination is asking them to become 100% carbon neutral, but they don't they don't have the tools to do that, we can flow them into our Cool Congregations program and we can teach them specific ways that they can do that. And in fact, um, in San Francisco, we're working with 10 congregations through a grant um, that's pretty time intensive, but teaching them the exact steps that they can take. Um, and, and it's sort of a combination of what can they do around energy efficiency? Can they put solar on their building? Um, you know, can they do some fuel switching within their um, facility? And do they? And ultimately, do they have to buy carbon offsets to get the rest of the way? We actually give them the tools that they can use there too. Um, so, you know, I think I think for us, it's a matter of tracking what denominations are saying and then. Um, helping to advise them on how they can actually get that further into um, into the average person in the pew who may not know that the denomination had this thing to say at all. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, I did see Iowa City sign on early, and I saw Des Moines sign in on the chat, so I know some of the Iowa chapters are on today, just so you know, okay? <laughs> Okay, and then uh, the first question that came in the chat was, are faith leaders ever reluctant to discuss climate change because it has been so politicized? How do you counter the concerns that it might be a divisive and controversial issue? Yeah, it, I mean, absolutely is the answer mm -hmm. to that. I mean, there's, there is, I think, um, a great deal of anxiety around that for faith leaders, primarily because um, and this is what I hear from from people when I talk with them is is well, you know, I have people in my congregation who are sort of across the spectrum on this issue, and I don't want to alienate people, um, you know, from the congregation. And so, you know, how how can I have this this conversation? Um, I think there's a couple of of things that ha ta talking from a faith perspective allows us to do. Um, one is um, you know, it allows us to focus on our values. So we can actually meet people where they are. Um, you know, you don't have to be a climate champion. <laughs> um, but our, you know, just like in my story, um, and it's one of the reasons I tell it is, you know, I came to this issue from 
um, from the issue of hunger. And so for me, you know, hunger was the compelling issue. And, and I needed someone to connect the dots for me to how climate change was connected to hunger. Um, and I think this is true really across the board in congregations where you can say, you know, um, is it immigration and population migration? Is that their issue? Is it uh, is it issues around water, um, both, you know, water quality and, and water scarcity in many places? Um, is that the issue? Is it hunger? Is it, you know, global conflict? Sort of where, where are people in the, con in, you know, what's their, what's their passion, right? What's the issue that they're passionate about? Um, and I think, to build some bridges, build some connection around climate change, um, you know, exacerbates these issues um, is really important. Um, but I also think it's interesting that um, there was a there was a survey that that asked why, you know, what motivates people to take action on climate change, and and I think you know, like two of the top three um, uh, reasons were one was. Um, for our children and grandchildren's future. And the other was to protect God's creation. And I think that's really, that's so, so that, so this conversation around protecting the earth, protecting God's creation um, is, is sort of a way that we can actually work to solve climate change, even it, on the occasions that we can't actually talk about climate change with people. Um, and so how is, how is protecting the earth one of our values, right? How is it related to our values? Um, and then, you know, then, then what do we do? How do we actually do that? Um, so I think in this, the, the why is really important for us. And the why for us is connecting it to values and it's connecting it to, um, you know, protecting the earth, protecting God's creation and God's good gift to us. Wow. Well, um, that is a lot of really powerful and useful information for us today. Thank you. And it's, it's also, I think, fitting that, you know, our founder came to this issue the same way you, you did. Marshall Saunders had set up over a million microcredit loans uh, before he started CCL. And it was about, you know, he'd been trying to help the most vulnerable people in the world and realized that climate change was going to undo a lot of that. So, um, yeah, so great to have you. You're welcome to stay on the next 10 or 15 minutes if you want, but it's a Saturday. And, uh, you know, it's a spring Saturday, so feel free to drop off if you want also. But thank you so much. That was fantastic, Susan. Well, and I just want to say thanks again to all of you. And I will urge you to connect with a state affiliate um, because I, I know there's a lot of partnership opportunities for us to work together. And I so appreciate the work that you all are doing. So kudos and looking forward to continuing our relationship together. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay, I have a couple of um, really exciting staff updates that I want to give you. First of all, Lene Pettengill um, is going to tell you how we had the we had a, a March uh, giving campaign. And Lene, can you unmute yourself and just tell us how we do? Did we do okay? Well, Mark, I have a one word synopsis of how we did. Incredible. <laughs> the goal for the campaign was to get up to seventy five thousand in monthly evergreen donations where all the monthly gifts would be matched starting in March and continuing to be matched each month for at least the next year. And these matching funds came from a group of our Climate Guardian donors who each committed $10,000 or more to the pool. And while it was a little nail biting throughout the month, on Saturday, March 30th, which was the next to last day of the campaign, we crossed over that 75,000 threshold ending the campaign the next day at an amazing $75,791 in monthly evergreen donor commitments, as in, woo! <laughs> Each month now for at least the next 12 months, we'll be matching these evergreen donations monthly each total. So this gives us a lot of peace of mind knowing that we have this steady, significant revenue stream of over $150,000 a month with the match now coming in to support our climate solution work. And it also is more convenient for a lot of our donors to spread their gift out over 12 equal installments throughout the year. As I mentioned on the call last month, we believe we're the first nonprofit organization to try this fundraising strategy. Once again, our supporters are blazing new territory, doing something no one else has ever done before. It's just how we roll. 
A huge thank you to everyone who's made a monthly evergreen commitment, to our Climate Guardian donors for creating the match pool, and for everyone who helped recruit new evergreen donors. We now have an exciting new big fundraising game we're playing. Thank you so much. Hold on. There we go. Okay, sorry, I muted myself there. Thank you so much, Lene. Fantastic. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, Danny Richter is also going to join us for a minute. He wants to talk about, you know, the different things that are happening around support for the bill. So in some case, people are endorsing it, and some people are issuing statements of support. Then you have things like the municipal resolution in Chicago. So Danny, can you kind of put that all together for us? There we go. Thank you yeah, okay. for, for muting me. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to do that. So uh, what I am most excited to, to share right now is uh, something queuing off of what Mark started this off with is statements of support. Uh, so first, let me talk about the nuance between a statement of support and an endorsement. Uh, it's pretty simple. An endorsement uses either our exact language or it uses the word endorse in their own language, uh, and that will appear on the supporters page of the bill, that's energyinnovationact.org slash supporters. A statement of support, by contrast, doesn't use our exact language and allows for some more nuance. Some of that nuance might even include some things they disagree with about the bill, even though their overall statement is supportive. It is the organization or individual's own words, not ours, and these are visible on our statements page, that is energyinnovationact.org slash statements. One organization or individual could be both an endorser and have a statement of support. Uh, for example, the Conservatives for Responsible Stewardship uh, falls into that category. Now, as far as members of Congress are concerned, both statements of support and endorsements are equally impressive. They don't seem to sweat the caveats or nuances in a statement of support, uh, but for maintaining good relationships with these organizations, which is also part of what we're doing, it is essential that if they have a statement and not an endorsement, we stick to the language of the statement. We should let them speak for themselves and not put words into their mouths. And if we reference their support, we should quote from the statement of support as much as possible and provide a link to it wherever it can be found online. So we really want to be responsible with their statements of support because uh, that really is helping us. Now that you're up to date on this important distinction, uh, who am I most excited about? Well, I'm very excited because we can now say that some of the largest environmental groups, largest faith traditions, and largest corporations in the world have issued positive statements about our bill. If you go to our statements or support page, you'll find positive statements uh, about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act from the Climate Leadership Council, the Environmental Defense Fund, the National Resources Defense Council, the National Wildlife Federation, the Alliance for Market Solutions, the Nature Conservancy, Ocean Conservancy, and the World Resources Institute. You'll find statements of support from the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, Evangelical Environmental Network, the Friends Committee on National Legis Legislation, Presbyterian Church USA, and the Unitarian Universalist Association. On the business side, this statement is not online yet. This is what uh, Mark talked about that BCL worked so hard on, uh, but we have received permission to speak about it publicly. And so I'm very pleased to announce that the Silicon Valley Leadership Group officially supports in principle the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Uh, note they were coming to Congress to convey this support in principle on April 2nd. So they've already been on the Hill talking to members of Congress about this. Um, and uh, who does the Silicon Valley Leadership Group count among its members? Well, I asked our 24-year-old diversity fellow, Destiny Lloyd, to pick from their list of more than 300 companies, uh, the 10 that were most impressive to her. And the ones she picked were Microsoft, Apple, Coca-Cola, Facebook, GE, Google, General Motors, Johnson & Johnson, the Intel Corporation, and Lyft. 
It would also be a mistake to assume that this group includes only companies based in Silicon Valley. So for example, Coca-Cola is based in Atlanta. So even if you're not in, in Silicon Valley, uh, anywhere in the country you are, it would be worth it to check out this list. And I don't think we should say that Microsoft or Apple supports in principle. It would be most correct to say that the Silicon Valley leadership group supports in principle and then list these companies. So definitely some nuance here, but this is, uh, this is really a big thing. Um, so you are free to talk about the Silicon Valley leadership group support for HR 76, 763, as, again, as long as you use their exact language support in principle. And like I said, members of Congress don't seem to care if the bill has a statement of support or an endorsement from a company or individual. They're about the same. And I think that that's why we're now at 29 co-sponsors for the bill including 12 on the committees of jurisdiction, over a third. We still need to add more Republicans, but I remain confident that we'll get that done. And it's also hard to believe this, but it's still only been 2.5 months since the bill was introduced, two and a half months. So you're all doing a great job. These statements of supports are really a part of the success that we've already seen, and they will be a part of the success that we have yet to see. So go get them. Andy, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Uh, I have three quick things I want to do uh, before we wrap up the call. First of all, um, this month in Canada, we're going to focus on Earth Day letters to the editor just for the whole organization. April is always our biggest month for letters and op-eds and also register for the May Canadian Conference. In the U.S., we know there's going to be a lot of outreach events in April and we're asking you to tweet those to your members of co Congress. That is, yes, your members of the House and both of your U.S. senators. So that means all of us are moving into the 21st century. So if somebody in your chapter knows how to tweet, please make sure that happens. And then also, um, we're, we're, there, you know, all the innovation in CCL happens in the field. And so some of the chapters started something called the Grand Canyon Project, where just a few people call every day their members of Congress. The offices tell us they don't hear from enough people. And we don't want to overwhelm them with everybody calling the same day, but just setting up a schedule where a few of you call every day so that you spread that out through the chapter. So I'm excited about those, both those actions. And then there's a, um, uh, there's a great communication exercise also. Okay, I asked Don Adu uh, to talk about bipartisanship for a moment, and then I have one thing after that. So Don, could you uh, unmute your line for just a moment? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yes, thank you. All right, great. Uh, well, I want to start by just saying that this is hard work. Uh, I was at the National Environmental Justice Conference in Washington, D.C., where I met Friar Michael Lasky. Uh, he is a member of the Franciscan Action Network, and he talked about being attacked by the right for their criticism of the administration's environmental record. He went on to say how he's also been scorned by the left for working directly with EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt to improve water quality. He said the middle is the most difficult place to exist, but it's not party loyalty that's important. The only thing that matters is doing what is right. Dr. Martin Luther King said cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asked the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. As many of you know, uh, the center is a hard place to occupy. For years, we've worked to build bipartisan consensus from conservatives and progressives. How have we been able to succeed while working in such a challenging space? The answer is simple. It's you. It's the work y'all have done that has created the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act and the subsequent support for it. This bill was not written by billionaires, corporations, socialists, or radicals. This idea is not owned by a fancy lobbying firm or an inside the beltway think tank. This idea is ours. Each of us owns a part of it. It only exists because we birthed it. We willed it into existence. The work we do is for more than just a stable climate. And our opponents are not Republicans or Democrats, not liberals or conservatives. Apathy, cynicism, and fear are our enemies. These are the toxins that have poisoned the well of government. It is only through listening, engagement, action, and optimism can we purify the waters of democracy? When I first started talking about climate change, I would hear from almost everybody why it was a waste of time or why climate change wasn't real. 
And I would respond with clear and concise talking points about temperatures, ice sheets, and sea level rise. And I'd be met with dismissive or defensive language. It wasn't until I stopped talking and I started listening that I finally began to understand. Tell me more. Tell me why. These three words open the door to really hearing people, hearing their thoughts, their ideas, and most importantly, their fears. Fear for the next generation. Fear of a flooded house with no way to cope with the rising tide. Fear of the government taking what has been their way of life for generations. Fear from coal miners facing the loss of the only thing keeping food on their children's plate. Fear of a higher light bill because $7.25 an hour barely covers the rent. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I'm just now beginning to understand the profoundness of that idea. Before we can free ourselves from fear, we must first confront it, name it, acknowledge it. We are here today because we fear the future. The National Climate Assessment and the International Panel on Climate Change's findings lay bare the naked truth before us. We stand at the precipice of a new world, one defined by a runaway climate, or one defined by our vision, defined by our action, defined by those that said yes to a green, stable, and prosperous world. There are those that would stare into the void of impossible and resign themselves to the darkness. We are the ones that light the candle of hope, banish the darkness, eradicate the fear, and turn everyday folks into climate champions, into stewards of democracy. We always knew this would be hard, but we will succeed. And when we do, we will solve the greatest environmental challenge the world has ever faced. And we will have done so through the democratic process, through the very idea that founded this country. Before us lies the pathway to a stable climate, a healthy world, and a stronger nation, because you refuse to believe in impossible and instead change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much for that. Wow. Um, speaking of climate champ, yeah. <laughs> Whew. Uh, so speaking of climate champions, uh, the last thing I want to do today is just talk about Representative Francis Rooney, Republican sponsor on the bill. Representative Rooney is our 2019 climate champion award winner. We're hoping uh, Representative Rooney can come to our reception at the June conference to receive our climate champion award. Uh, whether whether you can make it to the reception or not, Representative Rooney, we are looking forward to giving you this award, and we hope you can make it. It's not just your um, support for the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. It's been the consistent support for market-based solutions and understanding the importance of carbon pricing in making that happen. So hopefully, on behalf of all CCL, Representative Rooney, I'm inviting you to come to the reception. If you can't make it, we'll, we'll plan on bringing you the award in the office, but we hope you can make it to our June reception. All right, everybody, thank you all so much. Uh, uh, for those of you who can, it's always nice to get a chance to sign off to everybody. Uh, great month, everybody. Thanks a lot, and goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye, Bye. 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 Um, I think it, his, it says Mark under his name. Um, Ben's joke, goodbye. Goodbye! The second hand is stopping. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
few ideas. One is if, if everybody notices in the notes. <laughs> Oh, look, everybody's waving. Hey, let's do a quick wave to everybody. We're saying goodbye. You're on now. Look, look, look. Last <laughs> 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 Oh, great. No. <laughs> 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 Seen enough, uh, Roger.